Didn't take long to call the presidential primary race in Alabama this evening. It's no surprise former President Donald Trump secured the state's 50 delegates over Nikki Haley. And President Joe Biden also had little trouble locking up the state over long shot candidate Congressman Dean Phillips. If we look at the county by map, county by county map, you can see Mr. Trump had a little competition after getting the endorsement of state GOP and Every Alabama lawmaker, uh, Republican lawmaker, that is. And it was a mirror image for the Democrats with every county voting for President Biden, only fueling speculation that November will be a 2020 rematch. In total, it was a sweep for former President Donald Trump with more than a dozen states. Tonight, he spoke to a crowd of supporters at his Mar-a-Lago estate. When thanking his supporters, he wasted no time criticizing the Biden administration. And in some ways, we're a third world country. We're a third world country at our borders, and we're a third world country at our elections. And we have to stop that. We need a fair and free press. The press has not been fair, nor has it been free, but maybe someday they will be. At last check, Mr. Trump is now less than 500 electoral votes away from locking in the Republican nomination. All right, some of the big races across the state are in districts where we have new congressional lines. We have team coverage from across the state. We'll get to them in just a minute. But the race for House District 2, easily one of the closest watch races in the state. Last summer, the Supreme Court ordered our congressional map be redrawn to provide a second black majority district. And candidates came out of the woodwork to try to secure that nomination to potentially flip this formerly safe Republican district. For the Republicans, it looks like State Senator Dick Brubaker leads that pack, but it has not been called just yet. And for the Democrats, House Minority Leader Anthony Daniels and Shamari Figures also moving forward in a runoff. One of the candidates, State Representative Wandeling Gavan, came up short in the Democratic race. WVTM 13's Lisa Crane caught up with her at uh, her watch party this evening in Montgomery. What does she have to say, Lisa? Well, guys, we talked to her just a couple of minutes ago, and she hadn't decided at this point whether she was going to get behind Daniels or figures in a runoff election. She said she was disappointed that more women voters didn't turn out to support the women on the Democratic ticket during this primary. Now, when she arrived here hours ago, her supporters were here to cheer her on. She said she ran because she believes in democracy and she didn't want to miss out on this opportunity. But she was very disappointed in the voter turnout today. She called it scary. She says no matter who wins, they have to break the code on how to motivate voters to show up. Try to galvanize the Democratic Party. I mean, no one, whoever wins, is going to have to do that. You're going to have to galvanize a base. That means working with those who did not win, uh, trying to figure out what that looks like. But we've got to figure out how to get people. The Democratic Party is going to have to figure out how to get the people to the polls in November. Now, Gavan says this new congressional district is an opportunity. Whether that is an opportunity for the Republicans or the Democrats remains to be seen. Now, WVTM 13's Magdala Lusant is not too far from here at a, another Democratic candidate's headquarters. Magdala? Yes, Lisa, we're about 15 minutes away from you at a church in Montgomery where Marika Coleman was holding her watch party here. Now, everyone has gone home, but Marika Coleman didn't want to call it a night because she wanted all of the numbers to come in. She is proud of the uh, campaign she says she ran. Now, Marika Coleman, we know she's been in Montgomery all day today at polling places, thanking her supporters. And those people showed up tonight embracing her at this watch party while they waited for the results to come in. Now, Coleman, it was one of the top candidates voters wanted to see represent Alabama in the House in Washington, D.C. And as we've been telling you all year long up until today, District 2 was newly created after the Supreme Court approved a three jury panels new version of Alabama's congressional map. This was only done because legislatures were not drawing a map that fairly represented the black vote in the state. Well, Marika Coleman tells me today they've been hearing that people were not notified. They had new polling locations and some didn't know their district had changed. In addition to we're hearing that, you know, nearly 5,000 ballots um, did not have the correct district on it. Now that is a travesty. Um, that means 5,000 people within the district um, here in, in Montgomery were disenfranchised if they did not have the opportunity to vote for the candidate of their choice. This entire court case was about African Americans having the opportunity to choose the candidate of their choice. And if nearly 5,000 ballots were misprinted, then we have an issue. 
I did call Montgomery County's election center to get this information confirmed and I was told someone would be calling me back and at this time I have not heard from them. Uh, Marika tells me that she spoke with someone who is very close to this redistricting lawsuit uh, who is out in Mobile and they tell her that this is not over and they are planning or planning the process, the court process right now. And she still wants to see a second uh, congressional district for African Americans in Alabama. We're live in Montgomery. I'm Magdala Lusant, WVTM 13. Thank you, Magdala. Well, several congressional incumbents were able to fend off their challengers tonight. In District 3, it looks like Congressman Mike Rogers beat out Brian Newell and Baron Bevels for another two years in the House. Robert Adderholt, the state's longest serving lawmaker, easily defeated Justin Holcomb. It was a bit closer in District 6. Congressman Gary Palmer facing Garrick Wilkins and Ken McFeeters. Palmer will run against Democrat Elizabeth Anderson in November. In District 7, Congresswoman Terry Sewell dominated her challenger, Chris Davis. Christian Horn and Robin Leidecker, both on the Democratic side in this race, and it's still too close to call at this point. All right, another closely watched race has to do with the state Supreme Court current Chief Justice Tom Parker, who will be retiring at the end of his term. And we can confirm that current Associate Justice Sarah Stewart has defeated former state Senator Brian Taylor. Jerry Blevins uh, did qualify for the race, but his name was removed from the ballot last December. Justice Stewart will now face Democrat uh, Montgomery County Circuit Judge Greg Griffin in the general election. Well, voting was delayed for a couple hours at a polling place in Brighton. After the wrong ballots were sent there, a deputy brought in the, cor the correct ones. Due to that error, uh, officials uh, allowed the polling station to remain open until 9.30. The Secretary of State Wes Allen was hopeful that there would be a strong primary turnout compared to 2022. WVTM 13's John Papke joins us live tonight outside the Jefferson County Courthouse. And John, how does today's voter turnout stack up against years past? Well, uh, Sherry, not very well at all. In fact, the 17% turnout that we saw here in Jefferson County today was uh, less than half of those that turned out for the primary election in 2020. In fact, I took a look back at the last four primary elections in the state of Alabama. Before today, the lowest was 28% in 2012, still 11 points higher than today. In fact, the primary uh, runoff election in 2020 produced the same turnout Jefferson County saw today for the main primary. County election officials say there was simply not enough suspense in the presidential race, and the energy behind the top of the ticket is usually the factor which pushes voter turnout. For a presidential year, um, you know, I think we discussed earlier, John, it was around 35% in 2020. Um, you know, so yeah, I'm, we have less than half that this time. I don't really have an explanation for it. Now statewide, I just checked the numbers on the Secretary of State's website. The turnout for the state sits at 16 and a half percent with all but 10 counties reporting. So that would still probably, we'll probably see that number cl grow closer to 20 percent before the night is through, but still much less than the 33 percent the state saw back in 2020. Live in Birmingham, John Papke, WVTM 13. John, thanks. Well, these results were pretty much expected across the state, but we still have a long time before the general. Let's get over to our Ian Wright, who is joined by our political analyst, Dr. Marissa Grayson. All right, guys, so a lot of storylines to talk about tonight. Uh, former President Donald Trump uh, seems to dominate, uh, picking up at least uh, 11 victories in states that were holding primaries today. Uh, Nikki Haley looks like will win Vermont. So, so where does Nikki Haley go from here in her uphill fight to win the GOP nomination? Well, I think that's up to Nikki Haley, both how she wants to think about the short term, but then also think about 2028, which might be very much on her mind. So she needs to decide if she's going to drop out of the race or continue maybe for another week. All signs kind of point to things ending for her, given she uh, can't be really found tonight and doesn't have any rallies planned for the short term. And then she needs to decide if she wants to help bring her voters that she's got in in all of these states to support Donald Trump or if she's not going to work with him. So that could be a question of an endorsement. That could be encouraging the party to come together, a message that we heard from Governor Abbott just this evening. Mm -hmm. But she may choose not to. 
Let's talk about District 2 because that's one of those districts that we have been talking about. We heard from uh, a couple of folks who were covering some of those congressional races. This is part of that new congressional map that was redrawn. So this is the first time uh, we're seeing this district and we've got a very competitive race going on in District 2 right now. We do and that's not surprising given right. how many people are in the race. We've expected a runoff to happen, which I think we will see. Um, but name recognition and past experience is proving to be important, at least on the Democrat side as we look at um, figures who worked for the Obama administration, worked for Merrick Garland, and then also the House Minority Speaker in the lead right now. And it looks like those two, at this point at least, may be the ones advancing to the April 16th runoff. Correct, Daniels and figures. All right, so we heard from John about voter turnout, and the statewide figure he was given at this point was right around 16%, mm -hmm. so a significantly lower percentage. I mean, in 2016, it was 41% for a primary. In 2020, it was 33%, so we're seeing a significant drop. What gets voters out on a day like today to participate in the primary? Sure, I think some of it is a contested race. So not only is it lower than these elections you're mentioning, but also thinking about 2022 when we had Katie Britt and Mo Brooks on the ballot, sure. turnout was higher. And so I think some of this is that the results in Alabama were somewhat expected, but also the constitutional amendment probably wasn't bringing people out to vote. There wasn't really this reason. People sort of see the inevitable, I think, at least at the top of the ballot. All right, Dr. Mercer Grayson, thank you so much. Stick around. We got much more to talk about coming up a little bit later. Thanks.